Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of Let's Talk Risk with Dr. Naveen Agarwal. Each week we talk about a topic related to risk management of medical devices in a very casual and informal way. This is not a webinar or lecture, rather our goal is to talk about key topics and challenges in a very informal way and share best practices. I'm your host Naveen Agarwal and I'm the principal and founder at Achieve where my personal mission is to help you achieve success in risk management. My guest in this episode is Vilma Nestex Siena. We are talking about the challenges we face when we try to do risk management purely from a compliance point of view. This is what Vilma likes to call fake risk management, and she inspires us in this conversation to unfake risk management. And what is meant by that is we have to do risk management not from a place of fear, but from a place that is guided by our core values. This was a conversation in front of a live audience as part of a LinkedIn live audio event. You're about to hear a recording of our conversation. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. I'm so excited to welcome Vilma Nestex Siana today as my guest. And we'll talk about for the first 15 minutes about this fascinating topic that, um, you know, I came across in, in my LinkedIn feed a few months ago when Vilma started talking about unfaking risk management. It kind of intrigued me because uh, there is sort of a behavior, human side to risk management, right? We get so focused on the technical side, we, we sometimes forget how we are doing risk management. So I was intrigued. I started following Vilma's uh, kind of comments and uh, writings in her feed. And I thought, would it be nice to just talk about this as a topic uh, in our Friday conversation? So I'm so glad to have Vilma today to share her thoughts. Uh, guys, I would like you to keep an open mind, okay? This conversation is not about uh, challenging anything or making anybody feel bad about what they're doing. This conversation is more about trying to help us become aware of the way we do risk management in practice and, and uh, why that might be a problem. So I would love to have you keep an open mind and share your thoughts. Uh, before I uh, invite Wilma to briefly introduce herself and get going, um, I would like you to think about for our conversation later, uh, some of the perceived sort of difficulties, challenges, barriers that you come across when you try to practice risk management in your work. And I would love to hear that from you. Uh, with that, Wilma, I'm so excited to welcome you. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you for inviting me, Navia, and I'm so happy to be here and to talk about uh, risk uh, with this great audience. Um, yeah, and uh, shortly introducing myself, um, I'm in love with risk uh, and risk management for, um, I don't know, most of my uh, professional life and uh, I was working in banking for 16 years and now over 10 years I'm in management consultancy working with executive teams from different countries and uh, industries and uh, my relationship with the risk I I now I understand it started years uh, ago even before I I became a risk manager or consultant and um, the first time that I consciously became a risk manager, I believe that when I became a mother. Ah, okay. You know? <laughs> Say more about yeah. that. That's interesting. Yeah. You know, I didn't realize then, but now when I kind of like connecting dots uh, in my relationship with the risk and, and uh, this path to unfaking risk, I, I think that mo each mother, even each of us are risk managers. The truth is like this, but uh, uh, let me share about this mother's view. Mm -hmm. When they, I have two grown up sons. They are already students. They left uh, home, and um, now I can I can uh, reflect on this. When they were small babies, of course, there is like a lot of uh, things they 
first steps, uh, food. Uh -huh. I mean, they cannot take care of, the, of themselves and uh, I'm responsible for everything. Uh -huh. But I clearly remember that moment when they kind of started like uh, kindergarten or school and I realized that I cannot control. Uh -huh. I cannot control each step, each moment of their life. Uh -huh. And then it was a choice. What role should I take? Should I continue efforts to control, kind of like uh, asking them what to wear, when to eat, uh, when to clean the room, uh, and finding toys hidden uh, under the uh, <laughs> bed? <laughs> yeah, I know you have uh, twins, so you know. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. I, mean, I caught myself that, come on. You are not here to live their life. Uh -huh. Your your mission and uh, role as a mother is different. So what what is my purpose? What what will be the good end result? Uh -huh. To see that they are able to make decisions themselves, that they are able to take care of themselves and to leave some positive impact to the world. So then I realized that I should, I should allow them to leave the space to make mistakes, to correct mistakes, to learn, to, and you know, it was really hard for me, but I started like, I, I used the principle, say no, only uh -huh. if it's really no, I mean, uh -huh. mom, I would like to climb the street. Uh -huh. The, the, the first idea, oh, it's wet, you can slip, uh, the clothes are not right for climbing. Stop, uh -huh. Wilma, stop. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Leda, uh -huh. Uh -huh. please go ahead. And I realized that if I do not uh, embed control and those like stupid rules for, for them, there is nothing for them to cheat around. Because I see. if I say, no, you cannot, but they really want to climb. They will find moment when I will be not looking at them yeah. and will climb. And what does it mean from risk management perspective? They will be like worried in a hurry and they really can slip, fall, you know, and, and all those consequences. But if I allow them to test to learn to experiment mm -hmm. they there's nothing for them to hide or to be afraid or to cheat and they can build their muscles and uh, mm -hmm. their understanding and uh, their view so yeah so this this is the very beginning about this fake and unfake i see of course I see. In your indifferent uh, context so what i'm hearing you say is really you know at risk practitioners we ha it's a choice for us. Where do we put the controls and how do we kind of encourage actually the end user to sort of um, take actions in a way that are safe? So, well, I think my, my question to you would be for folks who are listening here, hey, we live in a compliance world, regulated world, and we have procedures, we have rules, we have forms and templates, and we want people to follow that, right? What is, the, what is your advice on how far do we go in creating this kind of a rigid structure where um, everything is con is kind of defined for them, and how can we overcome our own tendency to sort of lay it out in as much detail as possible? David, I have very nice short story uh, exactly about this compliance and controls. Uh -huh. So from the bank, I had to challenge. Uh, as a head of risk management in retail banking, I was assigned task, will we do something about management controls? Uh -huh. Auditors are not happy, central bank is not happy, please do something because they are not uh, executed in the right way. Uh -huh. And you know, I started to think, okay, so my first question was, how do branch managers know what controls they should execute? Okay. And the answer was from my team, Vilma, each procedure has standard 
And there is a section, there is a chapter about management controls. Okay, how many procedures do we have? Please collect, you know, we end, ended up with, I don't know, like one meter height <laughs> and several kilos weight of procedures. So from compliance perspective, all boxes were checked. Mm -hmm. We have embedded management controls in each procedure, but from, from management practice side, there is was there was like total fake and bullshit because sorry, sorry for <laughs> that's but okay. That's okay. So right. What kind of genius this brand manager should be to keep in his mind all this meter of procedures? Yeah, and I mean, you know, I think a lot of people feel that way too in our industry. Where, and it's curious that that you mention it because when I review warning letters from FDA, many times I find the citation is not that they were non-compliant to a regulatory requirement. They didn't follow their own procedures. So what I'm hearing you say is that we have so many procedures, so many uh, detailed guidelines and instructions that if we make a small mistake against them, that is when we are found kind of non-compliant, not because we are breaking any real law. Is, is, that, is that what that, I'm hearing you yeah. say? But this is possible to fix. So what we did, we went through all this stuff. We uh, made a list. We sorted it like daily, weekly, monthly, random, you know, all, 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 all that. And we made calendar with reminders and uh, uh, attachments to the procedure. Like a uh, bench manager is sitting and his calendar kind of, uh, shoes reminder, hey, you should, today you should perform this and that. And there's even link to the procedure if you for, uh, do not remember what does it mean. And you know, bench managers, they were so happy. Like, mm -hmm. I, I still remember, I mean, it's more than 15 years past uh, since uh, this case, but I still see their eyes uh, they were looking at me at uh, child, like children to <laughs> Santa Claus. <laughs> like, uh, you know what? This first time that when somebody saw how all these roles should be present in reality, yeah. how we can uh, how we can help to execute them, not just you know blindly putting that write them yes, down. Yes, yeah. we are not to comply so we have to have to have data and i have more recent case uh, uh, we had a very nice discussion with our central bank team and they shared that uh, like there are different uh, kinds of um, uh, entities in, uh, in financial services some of them have very nice documentation like in this case uh, with management controls but they have very poor results uh, as in in their business mm -hmm. and others have very perfect results and they are consistent stable growing profitable mm -hmm. uh, and taking care of their cl their clients and business but they do not allocate much time to documentation and they kind of you know balancing on complying not complying mm -hmm. so each one's are better uh, financial services. Of course, those who care about their business, but there is solution how can, you know, how, how to merge both things to have good business performance and to be compliant with. So my advice is to start looking, what do we do mm -hmm. as uh, as uh, professionals in our business to meet our purpose, to serve our clients, uh, to serve our shareholders, uh, to have uh, good uh, values and then to live our values. Uh, what we do every day, what mm -hmm. we do every week, what we do monthly, and then how we can make this visible. Mm -hmm. How we make the standard how we can we make this visible and how we can connect with things that the regulator is asking from us so oh, that's uh, yeah. awesome yeah that might be a bit 
the, this is the start of unthinking and getting rid of, of all this uh, crazy stuff that we are preparing uh, just because yeah. we are afraid not to be in compliance. So there's a lot packed in there, Wilma, what you mentioned. I want to kind of, before I invite folks to uh, share their thoughts, uh, there's a lot packed in there. I want to kind of highlight a couple of key points that stood out to me. First, you know, you are basically saying apply a risk-based approach to even your uh, sort of documentation procedural requirements. And second, what you are saying is that support your people, not just to like check the box, read and understood training, but support your people in executing the, the practice that you want, right? Your reminder idea. And the fact that you now have to remind people doesn't mean that you can you know, automatically means, I think that you cannot do 50 different things. You have to choose. And that choice will be risk-based, right? And the third thing that I think stood out to me was really this, this choice driven by focus on the customer and core values. If you make those choices based on that, you will always do the right thing by the customer. And oh, by the way, you'll also be compliant because your practice will meet the procedure. So I, I thought that kind of stood out to me and I wanted to summarize that a little bit for our audience because you know this is sort of a general topic, guys. And today, our focus is more about the behavioral side of risk management, how we practice risk management or quality management, what barriers do we, we come across? Uh, so I wanna open up uh, for a discussion, guys. Uh, you know how it works, please raise your hand and uh, join us on this virtual stage to share what you have in mind. Uh, share your frustrations and practices and any thoughts you might have. So this is more of a conversation, guys, not really uh, a big Q&A, uh, and, and our floor is open. So David, I'm gonna invite you first. You're on. Go ahead and please unmute your mic and share what you have in mind. Thank you, Naveen. Hi, Wilma. Uh, Vilma, I love it. They're so simple and powerful. I, I have two questions. The first is related to your reference to children. And how is that similar to including risk and controls early in the process cycle? Um, and my second one is more on the execution side. Um, how important is collaboration and communication uh, related to policies and controls as we move through change? Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, very nice questions and uh, um... I will try to maybe connect the both uh, answering this. Um, I, you know, I think that there is one question that I would love to be asked more often. When we receive some like regulation, you know, or like changes in laws, etc. I see organizations very often, they are afraid to even talk about this and they kind of take it, it you know, that as something uh, not comfortable, but uh, like a dirty thing that should be done and delegate to risk manager and leave this risk manager, uh, manager alone. But instead, I would, you know, I would stop here and ask, what does it mean? What does it mean to our business if we follow this regulation? What does it mean if we pretend that we follow this regulation? And what does it mean for us to ignore this regulation? There. That's fascinating. And yeah, and of course, this this question is not uh, should not be uh, for this management talking to uh, this manager like sitting in front of mirror and. <laughs> and trying, you know, to uh, to uh, to elaborate on this. Now, these questions should be uh, asked. Uh, the risk management is one who should be the brave enough to ask, but they should be addressed to management team. Yes, and things would change dramatically. I I, I can promise you. That is just awesome, Velma. Thank you. David, hang in there. We'll have probably more conversation on this, but I want to invite Roger now to uh, share what he has in mind. Go ahead, Roger. Uh, thank you, Naveen. Uh, thank you, Vilma. And I, I have to chime in and say, yes, I have also worked in systems with such highly convoluted and complex procedures 
it was really, well, it opened you up to exactly what Naveen said. People were were uh, having issues because they weren't following their own uh, highly convoluted procedures. So one of the things I try to do to get people to see this, I, I think what they are doing, they write the procedures as, as if an auditor is in front of them or answering questions that the auditor is asking. In other words, they aren't writing for what the worker needs to do with the procedure. They're writing with the sense they have to self-justify everything and have pointers back to other parts of the their uh, SOPs. I think they don't take advantage of the hier hierarchical structure of the way most SOPs are written. So I'm really agreeing with you, and I think it's a big issue in medical devices and the companies I've worked in. Thank you for sharing that, Roger. I think you are if you're basically uh sort of allowing us, your, this conversation I think is allowing us to sort of acknowledge the challenges we are facing. And it's showing up in warning letters, by the way. So it is. how do we respond to it? And what I'm hearing here is that from, from I think Vilma, you can say a little bit more about that. This is where we have to overcome our own tendency to kind of fake it. We don't want to fake it just because we just have to show compliance to a regulation. We have to unfake it. So I would love to hear more about that, Wilma, from you, if there's other other insights or other yes, kind of uh, things of that you point to that. Yeah, thank you, Roger. Uh, this is brilliant uh, insight. And, uh, you know, uh, I see kind of like a couple of things. One, one thing that worries me a little bit, uh, that risk is somehow imprinted as a very negative thing. Uh -huh. It's either uh, related w with this kind of very complicated, uh, difficult to understand stuff from regulators, auditors, etc., or even with this kind of like, it's still danger. It's, it's still a threat, danger, and uh, should be avoided. And we overproduce trying you know to protect ourselves but we forget who in front or what front we are trying to protect ourselves i mm -hmm. think in preparing those procedures and um uh, yeah so for, first thing is that procedures cannot be written in like in the office without people who really are doing the job mm -hmm. And I don't know who decided that all uh, legal documentation should be, or formal documentation should be so hard to understand. Gotcha. You know, sometimes for me, it's the feeling that uh, those uh, juniors, uh, or sometimes maybe even interns uh, who are writing procedures, they trying to collect and copy paste uh, things yes. because they they do not have space to understand how things are done in reality and uh, i believe that we would have much better procedures if we use this approach that is for example used in lean uh, like sop is written after everything is tested in working place, observed and refined, and is, this is the last step to formalize it, we are, when we see it, yeah. that everything is working. And yeah. using as much as possible visual things, uh, kind of simplifying and making it understandable, not for auditors, but for employees, and then auditors would be really happy. I know in person a lot of very bright auditors and they they love those visual simple things when they yeah. when they find uh, them. Yeah, that's awesome. So, okay, uh, love love this conversation, guys. Lorianne, please uh, unmute your mic and share what you have, have in mind. Hi, good morning. Yeah, um, I really like this conversation. And one thing that I found in my career, um, yeah, definitely. I've seen a lot of horrible procedures, but <laughs> the thing that really helps is if you have a template to go along with the procedure and the template also provides instructions on how to fill out that particular template. Right? For example, like a CAPA procedure or a risk procedure, you know, you have 
open areas that people have to fill in. But then in those areas, you know, you can have simple instructions just to help people because nine times out of 10, unfortunately, people aren't people that, that have to execute the procedures. They're not going to read the SOPs. They're going to be using the templates of the tools associated with that. And that's so great. those templates, yeah, that's that that. Also, I think the point you're making, Lorian, is that when you sit down to write a how-to, you have to know how to do it. That means you have to right. involve people who are actually doing the work. So, exactly. Rima, it, I think it's connecting the dots. What you are saying is that first get the practice right, and then write it up and and tell people how to do it. I know a gentleman who will have a lot to say about this, and I'm so glad, Kieran, you have joined us on this stage. Uh, I'm so thrilled to see you again. I hope you're doing well, and I, I invite you to unmute your mic and share what you have in mind. Go ahead, Kieran. Thanks, uh, Lillian. Uh, hi, everyone. Yeah, this is a great conversation, and it really is up my street in terms of what uh, I'm passionate about, about keeping quality simple. and. There's, there's so much in here that we, we need to consider. The first thing being that SOPs and work instructions need to be written from the perspective of the user that has to follow them. Uh -huh. They're not there to satisfy the auditor. The auditor will be happy if those procedures and work instructions are followed consistently. And the second point I'd like to, to make is that the importance of being trained in everything that we do. And that includes how to write effective SOPs and work instructions. So if we're involved in developing or writing the, the SOPs and work instructions, let's make sure that those individuals, uh, hopefully the process owners or their delegates, uh, are adequately trained and given the, the right training to be able to write effective procedures. Oh, that's such a wonderful point, Kieran. To be able to write those procedures, have some good training about best practices, making them simple. Uh, so I love that point you made. Uh, thank you for sharing it. Ed, uh, I think you are requesting to speak, so I'm going to bring you on here. Let's see if I can pull that through. Uh, but Kieran, if your I message may, about... Uh, if I may... Go ahead. Go ahead, Velma, please. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I would I would like, uh, I mean, this is a nice conversation and of course, things how to write a good procedure is are important, but the, I I feel that we uh, a little bit losing this, like a key point uh, about unfaking. Fake is driven by fear. Yes, sir. Fear not to comply, fear to talk about uncomfortable things, including risk, fear maybe even Sometimes a uh, executive team feels uh, that they have to prove that they are worth their salaries and they are so brave and <laughs> that they would never mention risk. Uh, but of course, yes, yes, compliance is important and we hire a risk manager to do this. So I believe that the first step is to drive away, away fear and to start talking about why we're doing this? What is our relationship with the regulator? Do we understand what it, what is requested from us and how this can change things that we are doing anyway in our reality? And this detachment between reality and documentation is the biggest gap and conflict that also contributes to generating fake. I love it, love it. That's that's awesome point. Uh, Ed, I'm glad you were able to join finally. Please uh, share what you have in mind. Certainly, uh, Naveen, this is an interesting conversation. Um, one thing that I learned many years ago uh, when I got the assignment to do a, uh, a manager of, of a quality systems at a new site that I was sent to, um, and I was uh, the first uh, employee on an acquisition site. So I had to go down and tell them uh, that they were going to set up a quality system. And um, I decided that maybe I needed to find out where the power really was in that facility. Because uh -huh. I knew it wasn't the CEO. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, so I hunted around and I found 
a gentleman that um, was actually the uh, head of operations who really ran things for the whole site. And I went into his office and sat down with him and explained what my assignment was and asked him some advice on how to do it. He said, when you get, uh, when you have to write procedures, and we were, we were implementing the brand new 21 CFR 820 at the time. Uh, so this was 1996. Um, he told me, he said, the quality people don't write the procedures. He says, those won't work. He said, what you have to do is get the people that are going to do the work. And that's something that I heard just a few moments ago. And this reminded me of this story um, to write the procedures. And he gave me the names in the different areas. Who was the best person in design? Who, who was the person in production I should go see? And all those kinds of things. And um, we actually became the first site in the company to get certified to 9001 and 13485 because I followed Buzz's uh, suggestions on how to approach things. And uh, the people that wrote the procedures really knew um, how to do things. So that, that's my contribution this morning. That is so awesome. And I'm so glad you shared this. Back to basics, guys. Back to basics. Look, so we are over time now. I'm, again, so excited to have this conversation, guys. I'm going to give Wilma a couple of minutes to just uh, collect her thoughts and share some key takeaway message with us. But in the meantime, I will, like always do, share some housekeeping announcements. First of all, um, again, I want to start by thanking all of you for being such a great audience, great participation. Love it. This is what we do every week. So if you love this kind of a conversation, put this on your calendar, 11 a.m. Eastern, every Friday. Put this on your calendar. You don't have to have an invite or a registration show up, tell your friends. The second thing I would say again is if you miss one of these, uh, you can subscribe to this Let's Talk Risk newsletter, which I write, and the link is there in the comment section of this event page. And finally, I always remind people, all of you have unique perspectives to share. All of you can help us learn new things, understand new challenges, and you can bring so much to our collective understanding. So if you're interested in being a guest, look, no preparation is required. There is no script. We all do it spontaneously every time. We just meet for 10 minutes, talk a little bit, and then go live. So if you're comfortable with that and would love to join me as a guest speaker, please, 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 please reach out to me. Uh, my calendar is open and all are welcome. Uh, with that, Vilma, please uh, share some key takeaway messages from our conversation today that we can remember. Yeah, you are a great audience, and it was such a big uh, uh, pleasure and honor and, and fun to be here with you tonight. It's, it's already uh, evening in, in, in my country. Uh, and um, so my the only and then the final message uh, regarding uh, this uh, unthinking risk uh, thing would be, well, Risk is not a manageable object. It cannot be separated from life, from business, from daily activities. And uh, let's melt the walls between risk management and uh, performance management, strategy, and the uh, and entire company. Got it. If you are risk managers, be brave to ask uncomfortable questions, including what we should stop doing after we adopting this instruction or uh, how does it change our processes, our purpose, our rules, how does it align with our values. I wish you bravery and less fake, less stress, Thank you. Thank you so much, Wilma. I appreciate it. I hope, I hope, guys, we feel inspired by this. I hope that we feel we can do something, we can make changes, and that's what risk management is all about. With that, uh, thank you, everyone, for attending again. Thanks for everybody who came on board today and shared their view, their perspective. Wilma, can't thank you enough for inspiring us with this uh, conversation. 
I wish you guys all the best and a very good weekend ahead. We will meet again next week. Thank you so much. Have a good one, Thank guys. Thank you. Bye-bye.